everyone, and welcome to the Live Proud Podcast, powered by Evil Geniuses, a podcast where we discuss important topics that impact esports and the gaming world day in and day out. Every episode, you'll get a chance to hear the thoughts and perspectives and opinions from some of your favorite gamers, celebrities, and influencers. My name is Aaron Ashley Simon, and welcome to the episode on ageism. Today, we'll be discussing ageism and generational gaps. And with today's guest, I would like to welcome, of course, our co-host, pro gamer, Ricky Ortiz, and our special guest, we have Rachel Feinberg, co-founder and CEO of Vateo, Kim Meltzer, CEO of Destination Esports, and Andrew Sampson, CEO of Rainway. So today is really interesting because anytime that we discuss esports and the gaming industry, of course, the conversation is always around the youth and the youth culture more in particular. Uh, but what about those who aren't quite part of the Gen Z generation and those who are in the millennials or olders that are contributing to the overall growth of the industry. Now, I, I do want to first start off by defining what is youth culture within esports and gaming? What does it entail? What does it limit? And how do we define this specific culture for those who may not understand it? Uh, I would like to first start with, with Rachel with this question. I think you asked a lot of questions baked into one, so I'll try and answer them all. I think that youth culture um, is often people looking at people 10 to 15 or 20 to 30 years younger than them and saying, what are they doing? What's cool? How do I understand what they're doing? But I think the way we talk about it as people, let's say, in business or trying to sell a product or engage a specific audience is how do we reach the youth and how do we create a space where the way we are reaching the youth also includes people that aren't so familiar with TikTok or Twitch and things like that. And so I think that youth culture is the creative outlet and the way young people represent themselves, the way they engage on different platforms, the games they play, the words they use, the dialect, all of that. And I think it's how we kind of bridge that to an existing business industry and how it kind of grows from there. And uh, Kim, for you, how do you define the youth culture that's within esports and gaming? It's, it's kind of a funny question, too, because I feel like I'm turning 51 next week, and I can tell you from the age side of it, it's not that it's the age issue. It's more of trying to understand what I did prior to being this age. So my my thought process is back when I was younger, I was doing Atari and doing all of the fun, cool things that I thought was cool, but we've moved into a whole different realm from when I was a youth. So for me, youth culture is really interesting because I've had the privilege to be in the industry for 10 years, so I've kind of grown up with the different aspects of you know, 16 to, to 40 per se. And each generation is so different. So youth culture to me is that beginning of understanding life where they're, they're gaming, they're kind of getting through high school or getting through college. And it's kind of the finding themselves part of it. And then there's me on the other side, who's been there, done that could write a book on it, but yet has to always be in the know and always try to be as uh, up to date and, and listening and understanding what is going on in the generations prior to me. So it's it's a really interesting place to be because I thought I understood a lot, but even today, kind of joking with everybody here, it's like, there's so much to learn. <laughs> I have a lot to learn, you know, in the bigger picture of that. Yeah, there's definitely so much to learn. And everyone's definition, although it may be similar, it may vary from uh, what side of the industry or how you view the industry, or even your own individual age of, of how you define youth cultural. Uh, Andrew, what is your definition and how do you define youth culture? <laughs> I mean, I'm very analytical in the way that I think about it. And it's, you know, video games are becoming pervasive throughout um, young children, teenagers, early young adults' lives. And it's pretty amazing how they have the ability to shape all of these uh, more or less like all the values and practices that they have from all the in jokes that uh, allow them to befriend others to, you know, now with things like TikTok, you can even make a song chart at number one um, if enough people like it. So I think it's a very, it's a youth culture has evolved quite a bit from when I was a kid and uh, the, you know, our definition of culture was, you know, how, how long can we sit outside the mall for, for the next like four hours before we all get bored? Um, but now you have these kids that are able to just sort of have a global impact um, and, and communicate and engage with each other. And I think that's pretty amazing. 
It is pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also interesting that we, all of our ages vary, but yet we all seem to have a very distinct viewpoint of, of youth culture. Ricky, for you, how do you define youth culture? And, and even more so as a pro player, how do you define it within this scene? Um, I would say I define youth culture back when I was uh, younger, I feel to me youth culture was basically staying on top of console gaming and playing console games at home with my cousin and my family. But I feel like as, as, as it all evolves, I feel like the biggest part of youth culture now I feel is, is the social media boom. I feel social media is such a relevant thing. And like, like you guys were just saying, I feel like social media is so powerful now that like you can even make a song on the number one by just doing a TikTok dance that goes viral or like, you know, show a video game highlight, it makes the game popular. So I think that social media is definitely where the majority of the youth is now. And I feel like it has a very big impact on gaming and esports. And I wanted to kind of touch on that social media component because, you know, all of us have come from an era where social media really wasn't a thing. And now it's like the thing and it's so impactful, especially when it comes to shaping esports and gaming. So how have you seen social media change and redefine youth culture within specifically esports and gaming? Andrew, I want to start with you. Yeah, so I've been putting a lot of thought into this recently, especially around things like Fortnite, where our idea of social media has started to evolve to a point where we're starting to look at things less as um, Facebook and going on your feed and, and, and seeing what other people in your life are doing to more like with video games, we're starting to create what is, I would say, the next version of the Internet and this metaverse where you're able to actually go into a like a, to a new universe and um, and engage and like consume media and talk with all your friends. Um, I think vi- only with video games can we make that sort of next leap um, in how we go about befriending each other and, and having these really valuable social connections, especially in a world where we're not allowed to go outside anymore. <laughs> Yeah. And social media also has been really great in the uh, further growth and development of IRL events. Of course, right now, due to quarantine uh, with COVID-19, that has changed drastically. Uh, but but uh, Kim, you have been so heavily involved in uh, actual IRL events. How have you seen social media change the youth culture within the specific esports events? I think the most amazing part of it is, is the instant gratification of it. I don't know that anything in the world can get someone to feel either amazing or broken down within a matter of seconds. Like it's, it's become the identity of who we are rather than worrying about anything other than what's going on in their social media. And it's become the the technological kind of unknown and yet that's the thing that everybody runs to. So, so there's no human side of it. It's more of the instant uh, capture of, am I liked? Am I not liked? How does that impact me? Um, do I know who I am versus what is being said on social media? So it's almost like we're all celebrities trying to figure out how to avoid or, or fall into what's, what's coming out of it. And that's been the really interesting play for me being kind of the esports mom is that I'm watching that from a pro pro level. I'm watching that from an amateur level. And I'm seeing every day that if you, if someone is not on social media, they've lost a sense of themselves. It's almost as if they don't know what to do if they're not interacting in some form or fashion in the way of their social media. And Rachel, for you, how have you seen social media impact uh, when it comes to lifestyles integration and like fashion and styles integration into the youth culture? I think we use social media in a way that fashion brands 10 years ago could only have dreamed of being able to get instant feedback and critique, whether it's good or bad on your product is incredibly valuable as a brand and being able to then like immediately change production or the kind of fabric you're using based on something five people have DM'd you about is super valuable. And so I think we try really hard to use the fact that the youth are living on social media to our benefit and how can we use it to improve our business And the youth love to post pictures of themselves in this new product they got. They love a really fun unboxing. And so using that as a brand to engage them with our product. And we find it incredibly helpful social media in that we can tweet all day about how comfortable our sitters are. But once three of your friends have posted that they bought the sitters and they're the most comfortable pants they've ever worn, you're a lot more likely to buy the product. So having the youth on social media and being really honest and transparent with them has helped us a ton as a brand. And I think that 
the rest of the gaming industry is also using it as a way to engage with their audience and build community um, around their products, their games, their platforms, etc. And how have you guys been able to adjust, you know, like, like you're saying, Rachel, you're able to target the audiences, especially when it comes to the youth uh, with the products or just even target overall with content and events. Uh, so I, I kind of want to uh, shift a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about uh, advertising, the sense of how it is targeting uh, the youth within different sectors of esports and gaming. So from your guys' profession and expertise, uh, what are the actual advertising avenues news to target um, the youth within esports and gaming. Obviously, social media and, and, and social media buys and media rights are part of that um, and sponsorships. But what are some of the other avenues that um, those uh, people may not be more aware of? Uh, Kim, we would love to start with you. I, I would I would say that of all the people on this panel, I'm probably more the internal side of this rather than being more on the, the product business side. But I will tell you that the advertisement, especially with those that come to me from a brand perspective, have always wondered what's the like ideal age. And we've always said it's usually 16 or 18 to 25. And that's usually everybody targets. But they're starting to realize. And I think what's funny, again, going back to even from myself, that I'm an older person wearing video game uh, attire or or anything and they don't know what to do with that because I don't fit the age target um, but it's becoming more interesting because they're realizing that every game and every culture has a different kind of overlay like you said with fighting there's 30 year olds in there they're not just 16 year olds so it's been interesting because they take video gaming as a whole but they really don't understand that there is a lot of different cultures inside of video gaming and each of them have their own identity and their own target market. So, you know, that that's been fun to watch and like what Rachel does and, and some of these amazing businesses in esports, like they're so specific to who they're targeting because they know exactly who they're talking to. And that's been a unique footprint in esports that not everybody has. And, and Rachel, what are the other advertising avenues, especially when it comes to uh, lifestyle brands within esports and gaming? I think that uh, often people think they want to advertise to gamers. If you're advertising just to like gamers as a whole, personally, I'm not really clear what we're advertising to. Is it console gamers, PC gamers? Is it a specific game, casual, competitive? So for us, we take it really seriously when we're launching a product, how we're advertising and who we're trying to advertise to. I think this panel is on age and we have as an audience, Ateo, our buying customers are heavily college age and like to age 24, then we kind of have a drop off and we have a large amount of consumers aged like 30 to 38, which I understand maybe that's not an entire age range, but I think there's something really interesting about people that we picture as gamers, but maybe they're in the workforce and gaming is their hobby. So I think mm -hmm. the way we advertise and the way we've seen the most success is Reddit. Um, getting to the top of any Reddit thread means that community loves you, they love what you've done. And for us, that's worked amazingly well. We also use Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, but Reddit has been really exciting for us and it also doesn't cost money if you create good content. And Andrew, for you, you know, what are some of the advertising avenues that you either have used or have seen aside from the main ones that we always talk about? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, we have a product that, that's very sticky, but the thing that's been sort of the surprise for us over the years is that, um, when we advertise, it, we, we sort of take this mindset that every individual knows that they're being advertised to. And so you have to avoid pandering. You have to avoid getting into the sort of gamer speak. And you just have to really talk to the core values of what your product is. And I think for the younger generation, that means a lot to them because it, it, it's, it, there's no vanity attached to it. Um, I've come to find that in all the advertising that we do, people are more responsive when we're just sort of straight up about the product offering. We're not trying to... Um, you know, blow smoke and mirrors to make it look better than it really is. But um, the thing that's most surprising to us is that we have a large like demographic of just very older users um, where we have the major like, you know, 25% of our user base is anywhere from 14 to 18 years old. But then the, the, the largest like demographic is going to be your 30 plus year old um, in users. And we think that comes a lot from the fact that our application has been developed in such a way that we allow people that, used to be really um, avid gamers and were playing almost on, on, you know, on a daily consistent basis to get back into that stride. Um, now, even though they have you know kids and they work and they, they have all these other responsibilities, our app has sort of given them the freedom to play again. We've gotten so many messages 
um, from users about that very thing. And so a lot of our advertising moving forward focuses a lot on the individual and all of the benefits that it's going to bring from just like a personal, um, like from a personal benefit choice rather than it being this all encompassing product that's going to make your life better. It's just, we let you enjoy your video games more often now. And that seems to resonate well with um, both demographics of users. You guys made a very interesting point in terms of bringing up the 30 year old demographic. And a lot of times when we discuss esports and gaming, right? Everyone's thinking about the 30 year olds, the 50 year olds, even the 18 year olds, and even like early 20s. But I also feel like sometimes in this conversation, the 30 year old demographic is one that's not really focused on heavily. Um, so, do you feel like this is a demo that um, people should be paying attention to a little bit more, like the older 20s and maybe 30s, having people pay attention to it a little bit more when it comes to advertising in this space? Andrew? Absolutely. I mean, this is the demographic that is also most likely to be able to pay for things too. And so if it's like, if you're going to spend your advertising dollars somewhere, if your goal is to purely get your user numbers up, but you're not you know, looking to immediately maybe turn um, your sales figures up too, then sure, you can go and throw money at Gen Z and um, even some younger de and some other demographics, and maybe they buy whatever you're selling. Um, but if your ultimate goal is to really get one, get returns and, and get users who are going to either use your product day in and day out, um, or be, you know, loyal customers, go after this demographic of forgotten gamers. And I, and I call them that because it's like no one talks about them. Um, but, you know, just because someone's a parent now or just because someone, you know, works a full time job or is getting their master's degree doesn't mean they don't love to sit down for, you know, three, four hours and try to play a game of league. Um, and so, like, people forget it. These users exist. But um, we find that they're incredibly loyal to us and they're one of the sole reasons that our brand continues to grow. And, and Rachel, you know, that specific demographic, like Andrew was saying, that gra the demographic has the funds to spend money on when it comes to products. Uh, but is that 30 year old demographic also important in terms of creating um, that generational loyalty process when it comes to lifestyle products? So it's actually really interesting to hear Andrew talk about this group from his business perspective. And we talk about it a lot of detail. Um, that audience has been exceptional in regards to engagement and feedback. While they maybe don't, a lot don't have an Instagram account or they're not going to participate in Instagram polls about our product or giveaways or a craft night, um, they're definitely interested in engaging on customer feedback. We get so many emails from people that are exactly what Andrew is describing. They were gamers their whole life. They went to college. Now they work in tech and they have somewhat limited time they can give to this now hobby. And they're so excited to find a brand that is a bit more grown up, let's say, has great quality and products they believe in. And they're comfortable then spending $65 on a pair of sitters. So that audience has been exceptional for us. And targeting them and engaging with them is very different as a brand. So if you're a college student and you want to buy a Teo, but it's maybe too expensive, 10% or 15% off means a lot. And it's going to make you purchase a product. A 35-year-old that has a full-time job, has a family, the $65, $6 off a product is not going to move the needle for them. They want early access. They want more information. They want a bundle of products they can buy at once. So it's definitely the way you market and engage with them is very different than the younger demographic, but they've been incredibly loyal. They definitely spend um, and have been super supportive. And Kim, for the events and programs that you've been involved with, um, how has your experience been with uh, engaging with those who are part of the 30-year-old demographic or even just older demographic as well? Because I even consider like the late 20s as part of that as well. Um, how has your experience been like that? And do you feel like, especially when it comes to advertising within the esports event space, uh, that that is a demo that uh, isn't really talked about as much? I'll tell you what's funny, Erin, is that in the live event side that we've just lost now because of COVID twenty, you know, twenty twenty, and the issues in in thereafter, I have to say that the funniest thing is that when I went from Call of Duty, which was very specific to the community, they bought anything, they loved it. If it had the branding on it, they bought it. It wasn't even a question because that was what they were looking for as a community. So it was simple. When I moved into Vainglory, which was more of a, a 
a new mobile esports experience. You had younger kids, but I noticed that parents started coming on the scene. And even in Call of Duty, they kind of started to come together. But it wasn't until probably in 2013, 2014, that I saw parents starting to get involved. And I noted that parents are always interested in buying stuff with their kids for themselves. And parents became a new kind of market that nobody had ever thought about. And now I'm in Rocket League, which is one of the biggest communities and it's a very parent oriented. It's very much an older scene as much as a younger scene. And you've got a multi-tier target of buyers that are wanting to do anything that has the Rocket League logo on it. So it's been really interesting to watch the definition of advertising. And that doesn't even include the digital side, just the physical side has been interesting because people want whatever it is that's unique and different and is going to give them a story that says, hey, I was there versus something that's digital that they can't touch and feel and taste and see, but they're excited because they see that that it's something that they want, but they don't have yet. So, so it's been fun to watch the change, but definitely people are forgetting that, that those who were young gamers are now the older gamers and the older gamers, like Rachel was saying so beautifully, is that we that are the older group have the money to spend and we are spending it on whatever we want, let alone what our kids want. So it's been, it's been really cool to see how things have progressed over the last even five years. And Ricky, we were just discussing in terms of the 30, uh, 30 year old demographic, as well as other demos that people may not pay attention to. Uh, but for you being a pro gamer, you are someone that brands are catering to, you know, not only as a consumer, but also for sponsorship purposes as well. You know, there, there's going to be brands that wanted to reach out to you and have you be involved in their campaigns and just process, right? Um, so in, in your experience of what you've seen, how effective uh, or in what ways have you seen brands advertise towards people like yourself and especially within the fighting game community? Um, I'm personally still actually still trying to figure that one out, but I, I just hope that when a brand usually comes to me, they see that I am an over 30 gamer who is professional and who is com competing at a top level for over 10 years. And I hope that when they come to me, they think that my success in the esports world would maybe drive others to realize that, hey, like I, I'm around the same age or I'm a little younger or I'm a little older. Maybe I, maybe, maybe that will motivate me or maybe that will give me some kind of inspiration to want to do the same. And there's, there's, there's no age cap on gaming, I feel. And that's, that's the message I hope that they're trying to spread when they come to me. And listening to everyone talk, you know, there really is it. You know, Rachel, you, you were just mentioning how you have the 30-year-old demographic, but you guys have been, it seems like every single one of you is catering your services or your product or the work that you do to different communities in, in terms of age groups and, and even just different esports and gaming communities. Um, so with you guys having to target so many different individuals and kind of segment your, your advertising, uh, what do you all deem as effective marketing when it comes to having to market to the younger demo as well as the older demo and sometimes simultaneously? Rachel? Um, we typically, when we do advertisement, we focus it specifically on one person. We have done very large pieces of content when we launched Women's Wear, which went very successfully and we combined that for a reason. Ricky was a part of that. But we typically focus on like one pro player and their Discord community, their Twitch community, their streaming, their team, all of that. And so in doing that, we're really targeting whatever the demo of their audience looks like. The way we decide um, if it's successful is if we pick someone and over time they grow, if their community is filled with nice people. Um, we don't care if they all buy on the first day, but if they kind of start becoming part of the Ateo community, we deem that successful. And I think we also definitely look at metrics. So there are sales metrics. There are how many people joined our email list, how many people subscribe to our Discord, et cetera. So there's ways kind of to look at actual metrics, but we definitely look at engagement and community growth as a metric for success. Andrew, what do you consider or deem as effective marketing? Um, we actually just got done with a really successful marketing campaign. Um, called it your way in. And I think the thing that made it really successful is that even though we're a gaming brand and we're building out a product that is targeted specifically towards gamers, we made sure that we spoke about the product in such a way that 
it didn't it didn't feel like we were pandering just to gamers overall because some people don't necessarily identify with that title if you're someone that just you know plays every now and, and then um you're probably not going to call yourself an avid gamer or a gamer at all you're probably just going to say you play video games and so we focused on making a brand that felt mature it felt like we had built something that was high quality that you could trust it um, and the marketing and the visuals was really focused just on the user experience um, rather than, you know, shoving um, a bunch of cartoons in people's faces and, and, and trying to paint this story of a magical, whimsical game of world. We went with sort of a approach of, no, we're a grown up company. This is a product that is going to serve your needs. And you as an end user know you're smart and you know you're having problems and we solve them. Um, and we find that that was more successful than our past campaigns of being super gamery and trying to target just that one one demographic of end users. Like we managed to put on you know fifty thousand plus new users just from a single like short campaign uh, where we basically took our brand and made it graduate uh, high school. <laughs> and Kim, for you, you know. W- Let's. I would like to ask about what do you deem as effective marketing when it comes to having to market towards not only the youth, but parents as well? So 10 years, I've learned a lot, but I will tell you the, the best formula I can tell you is there's a couple things. When you're dealing with the kids, it's mainly listening to them. I'll tell you one thing about the youth culture now is that they're not afraid to tell you how they feel. That's for sure, good, bad, or different. And so they're very open to sharing their feelings about things, and they're the best at being uh, good at feedback. When it comes to the the older generation, I've been lucky enough to work with pro players and their parents, and, and it's just asking questions and listening to kind of the things that they find would be more comfort to the situation in which they're in. And I'm noticing even in amateur parent or amateur gamers that have parents who want to get into the steam, they also too have a lot of ideas and thoughts. And so it's been easy to take something that you just listen to and you can kind of add it into the, the idea of what it is that the product has to sell. So, so for me, it's mainly about listening, but then it's also activating the five senses and deciphering what do those five senses do within the, the marketing idea of what the product brings. Is it, is it going to be a lifestyle product? Is it something that is just an everyday product? Is it something that doesn't mean a lot, but could actually make a difference? So there, there's different ways of looking at it, but I also come from the sales side. So whatever I'm marketing, I'm trying to sell. So I'm putting those two worlds together to make sense. So it's kind of an old school approach that seems kind of funny at this stage in my career, but it's just bringing it back to some basics at this point. And the expansion of advertising is going to grow a lot more as there are, you know, the the expansion of the scene itself. And part of that expansion that I hope to see more so is the player ecosystem. Now, a lot when it comes to a lot of the pro players, they range really young. Uh, but it, for example, in the fighting game community, there are some very high quality competitors who are 30 plus years old and still are doing an amazing, amazing job. Now, Ricky, as a pro player within that specific demo, uh, for you, what do you feel like is needed to help support uh, pro players like yourself in terms of having more of a longevity in, ter- in your career? Um, you know, because we've seen certain things like burnouts and all these different things that ended people's careers younger. What is needed for you as a pro gamer to continue playing at the highest competition as you're getting older? Um, I think for me specifically, I feel the the big burnout phase for I, I feel even younger and older players is is competing. I feel like traveling um, FGC for when you complete there, it goes heavy on traveling, and I think traveling is it just gets so tiring after a while. It doesn't matter how what your age is, but I feel especially for somebody who's a little older like me, I, whenever I, I have jet lag, my jet lag is like insane now, and I feel like the the best thing for, for the fighting and community would be to have a better ecosystem in terms of online play. I feel like um, fighting games in general have a notorious reputation for having terrible online play. And I think if that somehow would be fixed, I feel like that would really help the longevity of just a gamer's, a FGC gamer's lifespan in general. And of course, if you want to have longevity in the fighting game community or in any kind of esports community, I feel you have to advertise yourself well and you have to you know, use social media really well and put clips and highlights of yourself. And, you know, it, it entails a lot of things, but I do feel like the online play is very important for the, for the longevity of the fighting community and the players itself. 
What do you guys think about the implementation more of online? I mean, we've seen a lot of online gameplay now because of quarantine and COVID-19, but could this potentially increase the player ecosystem, not only making it younger, but also allowing for more of older competitors and older individuals to be within this player um, player ecosystem that we're seeing? Uh, Kim, what are your thoughts? Oh, for sure. I think we definitely in the last eight months have seen such a huge increase in the amount of gamers that have come to to play, even in the midst when we were really in the middle of COVID and we were having to stay at home and being quarantined till we were. I was amazed at the change of the social media uh, back and forth with different players coming in that had never played these games before. And they were all of a sudden coming into the community and didn't understand the, the culture of the community because it was so new to them. And I think that even coming into live events as we get back into it. I've given my heart and soul and my life into live events and doing travel and hospitality and pro player experience because every piece of that has an art to it. And one of the things that I'm very, very happy about that I will never regret is that I put comfort into everything I did. So the pro players came to me and they got taken care of everything they needed, but it wasn't like I was babying them that they couldn't, you know, that they were over spoiled. It was more of knowing who they were, knowing what they needed and telling them your focus is to play and win and have a great time and I take care of everything else. So so in that respect, you create, again, a new culture in that type of an environment. And I think there was more people doing what I did. You'd see live events be a lot less stressful. But until we get back to that and seeing online, we still need to have structure. And I think if I could share anything that, that I find is becoming even more important now is quality of life. Doesn't matter whether you're 10, doesn't matter whether you're 30, it doesn't matter if you're 50. What I find is that 24 seven, 365 days a, a, week, a year, playing and activating in front of a screen is not okay. Like we need to find the business idea and the art of gaming in a right way to be able to suffice to getting these players to feel like they don't have that burnout rate, that they can play at their level and that they can be healthy. And I think until people realize that that is a business and that someone like Ricky, who's given heart and soul into this has to be able to be taken care of. And so it's an art, it's an experience, and it's definitely something that that we have to pay attention to both online and as we get back into the live events. And and Rachel, where do you see uh, other contributing factors that will assist with the player ecosystem growing? I think that one, we need to, um, as been mentioned, make it a much easier and more um, a more seamless experience when they are traveling. I think that we also need to build an industry that provides post-professional play jobs, that builds competitors into people that can enter the esports workforce or are somehow working with brands and monetizing in other ways. I think streams are really interesting, but I also think that brands, from the Ateo point of view, brands working with players or content creators or platforms and somehow creating jobs post their time as streamers or pro players is really important and something that unfortunately is often overlooked where the value of it is somewhat missed, where we've seen that happen in a lot of traditional sports um, as incredible ways for players to retire or stay in the industry but not continue competing. Andrew, what are your thoughts on that development of uh, transitional points for players to go more into the business side of things or uh, retirement plans for some of these professional players? Where do you where do you see certain opportunities for that to happen and how should the industry go about uh, creating these uh, opportunities for the professional players? Well, yeah, there are a couple of things where I think they can model this from professional sports um, or physical sports, such as, you know, uh, the NFL and the NFL Players Association having uh, 401ks and retirement plans and all these other support systems set up for players after they get out um, of the industry, especially, you know, for young players. It's really important to get financial advice as you're collecting and getting all of this money. What do you do with it? How do you pay taxes? Um, and then even for some of the older players, like where do you invest it? Um, how do you how do you increase your your overall wealth um, after you're done actually playing in the scene? Um, and then it's really important that players recognize how valuable they are even after they're done competing. Uh, the insight they they can provide into game development as consultants and um, as valuable members of game development teams and studios is. Um, it's, 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 there's a lot of untapped potential there. And so I think that there needs to be more work done within the industry to start setting up those paths to help people. 
And developing those paths will not only assist with creating more of those uh, transitional moments for professional players, but it's also going to contribute to the overall development of generational fandom and also generational uh, ownership and association that we see in traditional sports, where you have former players that own teams, uh, that uh, have certain positions within uh, certain companies, as well as, you know, you have families who the grandfather, the father, the mother, the brother, sister, cousin, they are fans of specific teams. Um, now we can see those kind of generational loyalty and generational fandom, not only on the competitive side, but also within lifestyle. Rachel, how can esports and, and the gaming world develop more of these generational brand loyalties? And where will we see that as these players and those in the industry get older? I think it's really interesting in gaming because I think that the ecosystem and the community have a fandom that doesn't actually exist to this extent as traditional sports. Um, the fact that people are fans of Twitch and buy apparel from Twitch, I can confidently say not that many people buy the standard NBA apparel. They buy their specific basketball team's apparel. And the NBA is the league, not even the platform. I guess you'd say like ESPN apparel. Um, and so I think there's really interesting ways to build fandom and community that are even greater and kind of deeper than exist in traditional sports. I think that we've seen it with like NZXT and their hardware. There is a fandom and a a plushie that represents the computer brand um, and seeing how that kind of lives on through generations and people is really interesting. We work a lot with platforms, teams, players, and how do we create these magical moments for their community and how do we grow their fandom and reward their existing community. And so for us, it's really focusing on those individual people and how they will then bring more people to YouTube gaming or bring more people to NZXT. And so really creating magical moments that then build a fandom around whatever it is we're talking about, not just teams or players, but platforms, games, all sorts of things. And magical moments are built during uh, live events previously, you know, even, even some of the online events that we're seeing. Kim, uh, for, the, for you to be able to see the growth and development of the COD scene and just seeing how these players are getting older and their parents are getting more involved, where do you see the potential opportunity to uh, develop that generational fandom uh, within esports that could help to elevate the industry as a whole? I love the fact that you're looking at some of the pro players that started back in uh, 2011. Um, Hector uh, from Optic or uh, Mike Rufio, who's with Envy, and, and we could go on and on and on about who started where and where they're at now and being parents and owners like you were talking about. I feel like starting as the only parent who was there in the beginning because no parent was going to go with their kid to go do some video game competition back in the day. And now you can't keep parents away from it because they're really proud of their kids because there's something to actually show for it. We've got to be able to create an atmosphere where although in 2020, trying to say this correctly, but it's, it's not the traditional family, but it's family as a culture, whether you have grandparents, whether you have parents, whether you have significant others, um, whoever they are in your life, we're finding that we really do appreciate and enjoy what is going on in front of us, especially because now we have social media to be able to actually see it. But I think the three dimensional side of life is still kind of not where it needs to be. And what I mean by that is Anything that we do on a one dimensional way inside of a game has to come out in something that we can use our five senses for. So until we really grasp that, that we have something to be excited about and we start giving them something that takes them beyond the screen, will we really start seeing fandom grow even more so? But parents are definitely in it. I know in Rocket League, we have grandparents that are coming to watch their grandkids. And I'm talking about 80 and 90 year olds who are not afraid to come to a live event and be really excited. I have Garrett Gordon, whose little brother, who's probably five now, is one of the biggest fans in the world for his big brother being on a screen. I've watched it all. It's amazing. And it's really, really, it'll make me cry because it's just from where I started to where we are now, it's it's bigger and badder than what it's ever been before. Like badder meaning just awesome. Like we really are in an awesome state right now on a bigger level. We really are. And there's definitely opportunity for, for growth moving forward. But how can we grow when... You know, part part I guess part of the part of the problem I think we're all trying to solve right now is that the esports industry is run by the youth essentially. And we're starting to see 
whether it is uh, older individuals' viewpoints and and and, be, and individuals that are being added into the scene, as well as non-endemic brands. So, Andrew, how can we create these generational fandoms and create these structures that uh, have either been in esports and gaming or are just newly being added? Um, but how can we do it in a way where the youth will embrace it and drive it? Uh, but also be able to be open to listening to those who are, you know, 30 plus years old who are trying to make the scene bigger and better. I mean, it's, I think the, it really, it starts with investing in the youth that are trying to go out there and build businesses in the esports and gaming space in general. Um, regardless of their background, if, if we can find that these, you know, the golden nuggets of talent that are out there trying to build businesses that are going to help take esports to its next stage, and um, whether it be through technology that makes it more accessible, whether it's through um, lifestyle brands that make it, you know, more mature, um, or just through like people trying to build out the actual infrastructure that is necessary um, for us to go out and create plans like that 401k, it starts with investing in the youth. Um, there are going to be a ton of older gamers out there who are also working in the space and are, are already running businesses there. And like they will have good ideas and they will help implement things. But really, then we have to look at the next generation of gamers coming up that are also also have that entrepreneurial spirit um, to be the ones that start setting the pace for what is what are the businesses that we need uh, to grow esports overall. And the support goes even beyond just the younger demo. The support even goes towards those who are like Ricky. Uh, Ricky, uh, with the support aspect of it, uh, do you yourself feel like you deal with ageism within the competitive scene as a pro player? Uh, and do you feel like you're receiving that necessary support? Or do you feel like sometimes that support may lean a little more towards the younger demo? Um, I, I, I definitely feel like I don't receive, or maybe it's just an FGC thing, but I definitely feel like I don't receive any ageism in terms of being an older player, because there's a, there's a fairly good amount of older players in the FGC who play online and who play at, in competitions. But I, I wait, Oh, I forgot the last part of the question. Can you repeat the last part again? Yeah. Do you, uh, so do you feel like, uh, have you ever dealt with any um, ageism and do you feel like you're receiving the necessary support uh, despite, you know, a lot of brands are just trying to target more towards the younger side of the esports scene? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, I, I do think that um, I think every competitive game, I feel they love an underdog and they love an up and coming player. So I think that is a really big aspect of just competing in a game. And I feel like it's the nature of the beast where people want to see up and coming fresh players. I, I would say it, it's not on the terms of ageism, but I do feel that in the FGC in particular, when they see me win, it's not as exciting for them anymore because they see me win so much that they're like, okay, well, we want to see somebody new win. And generally it's, it's the younger players who, who are going to break out and, and win and whatnot. But I feel like for me personally, I do receive a lot of um, great support in the fighting community. But um, I do think, like I said, I do think people like to see new and upcoming players always. And I just feel like that's going to be a thing forever, I feel. And for the rest of you, have you guys dealt with either ageism or a, I would like to say, a generational disconnect uh, when it comes to working in the esports and gaming industry? Uh, Rachel? I think that you said a lot of the people running the industry are young i would say is that, is that correct to say uh yeah I, I would say you know we have a lot of young people that are running whether it is them um owning a team or or, or being pro players uh but there's also various different ogs in this scene as well but i think that most people just view it as just mostly being a young people that are running the industry i think as someone that i would say is young to be running a business or maybe not but a lot of times I think that the ideas I might pitch to someone or recommend to someone sound outlandish or crazy. And truly, they're just based on taught skills of trend spotting that are what the youth are doing, what's currently trending on YouTube or something like that. And I think often the people that are making the decisions are more disconnected from that age group or more disconnected from what their own audience might want. And so I think that it's really important that everyone put in the work to kind of really understand and show up at those events in person and, you know, be in Twitch chat when their game is streaming and really understand the culture and what's evolving. Otherwise, I don't see how the industry can kind of meet in the middle of sorts. And um, I think that it's important for kind of everyone, particularly 
all of us that run businesses to understand what is happening within the games and other things. Andrew, where do you see, uh, or have you experienced ageism and where do you have see that kind of, uh, uh, I guess, factor in the industry or disconnects ultimately when it comes to different generations? Yeah, I mean, being black in the industry, I've experienced a lot of isms, but <laughs> from an ageism perspective, um, I often I'll find that the ideas that I put forth, while yes, they can seem audacious in the, like, in the execution strategy, they're rooted in data and in and, and facts. And, you know, as Rachel mentioned, looking at the trends of the market, how are, how are, you know, these younger users responding, generally what is happening in the game industry, I tend to find that, you know, investors or potential partners are dismissive um, because, you know, how, how are you as a 25 year old going to go and build this generational business uh, with like this idea? Um, whereas I would believe that, you know, they'd probably be a little less dismissive if it was some veteran um, you know, business entrepreneur that's been doing it for 35 plus years came, came to the same idea. Um, so that can suck at times, but, you know, I still go and execute on the idea anyway. <laughs> um, and, hope, and hopefully it works out and, we, you know, we get to say you told him so. Kim, what about you? You are the esports mom and been around for quite some time. You know, have you dealt with ageism or do you or how do you see the the generational disconnect being? Um, I want to say an issue, but maybe something that is uh, should be addressed within the industry as a whole. I'll tell you what, I am really honored, first of all, because when I came in in 2010 and coming into Call of Duty of all things, I mean, the funniest part for me was I couldn't even hold the controller properly in the middle of these 50 top press guys at Activision and and to even know what a gamer tag was and to get that one of them said you're the cod mom and kind of took it and ran with it right and 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 when you're in a position where you're in the middle of it in the trenches every day i feel that ageism isn't a problem because you're in it with them whether you're playing the game or you're part of the experience there's a, a relationship and relationships are key i think now i'm seeing that the non-endemic brands with the brands that are that are endemic with the executives who are the upper echelon who are looking at holding the baton and ready to move into retirement but have to like leave a legacy and then you've got the young kids who are trying desperately to find that pathway. We need to have a definite mentorship uh, of having the older generation who knows where they're going and what they need to work with the younger generation who literally have no idea. I mean, it, it's it's definitely a, mis, a disconnect and a, a misunderstood concept, not because mm -hmm. it has to be, just because we don't communicate as well as we should in this industry and it needs to happen. It needs to happen. And, you know, age doesn't matter in this industry. It's all about how you apply the certain skill sets and the talent that you need and for yourself, but also ultimately for the industry. Uh, we are about to wrap up, but before we end, I always like to end the podcast on, on a special and even positive note. Uh, we always talk about the youth, but let's also show some love to those who are 25 plus, 30 plus. Uh, who's someone in the industry that you think should uh, get their flowers and someone that you respect uh, who is part of the older generation within the esports and gaming scene? Rachel, I want to I start with you first. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say Elizabeth and Ryan from YouTube Gaming. Nice, nice. <laughs> Why? Um, I think that they both somewhat grew up in this industry, but have now entered like the workforce and are doing exceptional things for new creators and growing the audience, but also understanding what's happening. Andrew, what about you? Who's someone who's 25, 30 plus year uh, older? It, was, it would be my our core advisors, um, David Perry and John Kimmick. Uh, they have been in this industry for decades now both doing incredible things and it's you know it's amazing that for the years of experience that they have that they can always manage to keep a pulse to what's going on um and really be able to like take that information and then give it right back uh to me and, and all of their um sort of uh whimsical ways and then from that i can go off and continue to build my business so those two have been valuable partners as i started to enter the industry Ricky, who's someone who's 25 to 30 plus year old that you would love to shed some light on? Uh, this one's an easy one for me. I had to give it to my brother and my family member, uh, Justin Wong, uh, who's just recently got married and recently just had a baby girl. I feel like he's been competing at the highest level for 20 years and he still shows no sign of slowing down. And he's a perfect example, I feel, of a player to show you that 
the the being in esports, you there is no age, there is no number. You could you can play and compete for as long as you want to, unless you're until you're until you're not having fun anymore. And lastly, Kim, what about you? I would say more or less, I'd like to give a shout out to Sir Scoots and Dorothy Ferguson and those who have been in this industry 30 years, who've been hidden behind the scenes, who have created some of the best that we know of in this industry, who've given us the trailblazing techniques to get where we are. There are a lot of people in this industry who hide behind the camera that we don't know about, but really a shout out to all of them because there's more than I could even like say on this podcast. Yes, shout out to all of them, as well as shout out to you guys for joining us in the discussion today. I really, really appreciate it. It was such a great combo surrounding generation, collaboration within esports and gaming. Now, to all the listeners and viewers, no matter how young or old you are, there's room for everyone in this space. It's an opportunity for the youth to not only lead a movement, but it's also for the older generation to help guide them and for the entire community to build up the amazing world that we all love and cherish. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Live Proud Podcast, powered by Evil Geniuses. As always, my name is Aaron Ashley Simon, and we'll catch you guys in the next episode.